Hello, many in Christian Fellowship. So good to see you. So great to see your smiling faces again. This message is about doing good to ourselves and others. It's about faith and the consequences of courage. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. These are challenging times. We've seen bushfires, COVID-19, economic stress, leaders lying to us, huge mistakes being made, the stifling of individual liberty, a culture increasingly against Christianity and the Bible. By the way, thank you so much for supporting us. Diane and I don't receive JobKeeper or JobSeeker or any stimulus payments. We're not registered with the government for any support. We hope and trust that our support comes from Jesus and you guys are playing a really big part in that. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your sacrifices. Thank you for trusting in us and trusting the Lord and supplying our needs. God bless you. I want to do good. You want to do good to ourselves and others. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But how do we do good when there seems to be so much against us? Well, this story of Jonathan in 1 Samuel 13 and 14, the historical account of one of Israel's great battles in 1000 BC, hopefully will encourage us. As we learn of Jonathan's faith, courage and the actions that resulted in a nation being changed. In particular, we'll look at the obstacles he faced. And maybe while we're doing that, we'll think about the obstacles that we might face in doing good. Israel was completely oppressed. Let's have a look in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords and spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe and his sickle. I can imagine you guys having to go to the enemy's camp to get your farming tools sharpened and paying for the privilege. I think you'd be quite angry and upset. And the charge for a sharpening was a pin for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks and the axes, and to set the points of the goads. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan but they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. Amazingly, there were only four weapons, two swords and two spears left for the whole army of Israel. And they were held by King Saul and his son, Jonathan. Israel was completely oppressed. There was no blacksmith, no weapons. But what oppression is stopping us from doing God's work, from doing good? Maybe lack of energy, lack of motivation, bad news, or the overwhelming onset of troubles. Perhaps we need a rebellion. Well, a rebellion began in Israel. It started in chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, with Saul raising an army of 3,000 chosen soldiers. He gave a 1,000 of those to Jonathan, and Jonathan attacked the Philistine garrison. But this was like prodding a bull ant's nest or whacking a wasp's nest. The Philistines came out in force. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, 300,000 foot soldiers, not just to oppress this time, but to completely annihilate. Like when you have a God idea and you decide to step out to do something for him. It seems sometimes like all the forces of the enemy try to shut us down. And Israel fled, chapter 13, verse 6. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over to the Jordan, to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Let's face it. Life is hard sometimes. We had a phone call a few weeks back. A dear friend had gone missing. It made me think about their family. 
and the stillbirth when they lost their first child. Cancer that took their second child at age 21. They lost all their money in a scam. Termites infested their house and their house had to be pulled to pieces to fix. Then the husband and father contracted early onset dementia and has gone missing. Well, he turned up later that night or he was found. But it just reminded me of all the challenges that we face in this world and maybe all the challenges that are coming against you. But there is hope. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 14. Verse 1. Now it happened one day, just one day, that Jonathan the son of Saul said to the young man who bore his armour, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. So most of them had run away or were hidden or were trembling. Ahijah, the son of Ahitab, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Beneath the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes and the name of the other, Sina. The front of one faced northward opposite Michmash and the other southward opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armour, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. In other words, it doesn't matter what the numbers are against us. It won't matter at all to the Lord and his power. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, go then, for I am with you according to your heart. This is an amazing statement by the armor bearer or, as he was sometimes called, the bodyguard. In the Living Bible, it says his response to Jonathan's idea to go attack this massive army was, fine, do as you think best. I'm with you, heart and soul, whatever you decide. What a man of faith. You know, Matthew 17, 20 says, if you have faith, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And Jonathan and his armour bearer had faith. They began to trust in the Lord. So Jonathan said, verse 8, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, so he makes a little test, a little qualification to come from the Lord. Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up for the Lord has delivered them into our hand and this will be a sign to us. More faith. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, sarcastically, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. So Jonathan took the spear. He went on ahead. He started killing the enemy and the armor bearer followed him with a sword and finished them off. That first slaughter, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. We've got to remember that this is an historical account. This is not a parable. This is the incredible faith and bravery 
of two individuals. And there was a trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked so that it was a very great trembling. Maybe you have faith to get started. Maybe you've got something burning in your heart that you'd like to do for God. Well, I wonder what sort of obstacles are going to stand against you. Jonathan faced some incredible obstacles when he decided to get started. He was part of a tiny, fearful army. He faced overwhelming opposition. He was a young man, possibly around age 20. His bodyguard, who was called a lad, was only a teenager, maybe 15 years old. Surely Jonathan would have faced some sort of anxiety making a big decision like that. He would have had a lot of negative peer pressure against him. And I wonder about the oppressive weight of doing nothing and having everybody around you doing nothing. That happened to me once. When I left school, I started work for the Woods and Forest Department in South Australia. I started as a timber stacker and became a sawyer, head sawyer, supervisor, accident prevention officer for the whole southern milling operation. But then I missed out on a promotion. I got the sulks and I left. And I spent some months in inactivity, not doing very much at all, living on my long service leave and holiday pay, supporting my family. And it wasn't until an older Christian, a member of the church we were going to, gave me some advice, and that advice was pretty much get off those soft parts of your anatomy and start to do something. And I took his advice and I did. I bought a small business, a milk ground, borrowed some money, and started work again, and I don't think I've stopped since. The, but what sort of things do we need to get us moving and to get us encouraged? Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40, tells us to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves. But loving ourself doesn't necessarily mean being easy on ourselves. Here's a bit of advice from clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson. One, stand up straight with your shoulders back. In other words, face your troubles with courage. Two, treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. We're often praying for others, but are we really praying for ourselves and are we doing good to ourselves? Some people treat themselves worse than they do their animals. And three, make friends with people who genuinely want the best for you. This armor bearer absolutely wanted the best for Jonathan and his attack on the enemy. But you know, many people that get around us don't really want the best for us. In fact, they enjoy seeing us fall. Well, it's good for us to look for people who will really genuinely want the best, who will pray for us, who will encourage us, who will support us in doing something good for God. So now you have a mustard seed of faith. You want to do good. You're ready to take a step. Let's have a look at what happened with Jonathan in 14 verse 8. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. So he took a big step. He went to attack the enemy. Did things immediately get easy for Jonathan? I don't think so. He experienced derision and mockery. They showed up. The Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden. They said, come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan was climbing Bozes, the north face. It would have been exposed and hot. He would have felt pain, awkwardness, going up on his hands and knees, possibly bleeding. It was immensely laborious, hard work. Gravity was against him. The enemy were inaccessible. He was outnumbered at least 10 to 1. The cliff he was climbing was topped by what's called a natural fortress and he had a distinct height disadvantage. 
So he faced many challenges, just like we do when we want to do something good for God. I mean, in our culture, we would have great difficulty talking publicly or in our workplace about marriage being between a man and a woman. And perhaps even harder would be to describe genders as just two, male and female. But if you keep going, if you keep moving, let's have a look in chapter 14, verse 14 and 15 and see what happens. Verse 14, that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled and the earth quaked so that it was a very great trembling. So now we're seeing a trembling amongst the enemy, in the enemy camp. And for us, that could mean that when we first take a step, when we continue, that there is a great trembling against our spiritual enemies. God is with us. Nothing is impossible. We'll shake every spiritual chain around us when we step out and keep moving for God. And what else happens? Verse 20 to 22. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle, and indeed every man's sword was against his neighbor, and there was very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Others follow. Others start to move as well. When we start to move, when we show faith in God, when we begin to step out to do good, others get encouraged and they begin to move as well. Together, we can win. Our faith will triumph. Your desire to do good will bear great fruit and you'll encourage others to do the same. There's another picture in this scripture, of course, and as always happens in the Old Testament, there's a shadow of things to come. God and Jesus Christ were the only ones who had weapons against sin. Just as Saul and Jonathan were the only ones with weapons in the natural, God the Father and Jesus Christ were the only ones to have the weapons needed to free us from sin. The whole world was under the sway of the wicked one. And Jesus left the camp. He, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took the form of a bondservant, and came in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Overwhelming enemies were against him. He sweat blood. He was beaten, tormented. He climbed the terrible hill of Calvary. He was hot, exposed, ridiculed. He bore his cross. He struggled. He carried the weight of sin. And he won. He defeated death. He had the victory. And he started a movement. He started Christianity. He started a great change of people's lives across the earth. He started something for all men to believe in, to follow. Now, this day, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, Now it happened one day. This day, will you follow Jesus in his faith? Will you follow this example of Jonathan in his faith? Will you be encouraged by this historical account? Will you consider that it's possible for you to step out and do something incredibly powerful for Jesus? Will you be ready to reignite those matters that the Holy Spirit put on your heart? Will you look inside yourself again and see that there's something really wonderful that Jesus Christ would like you to do? To do good for this earth, to do good for others, to stand up, to stand strong, to step out. Will you once again step out to do good? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, thank you for this incredible example. Thank you for 
the words of truth in the scriptures. Thank you for Jesus and what he did in going to the cross. Thank you for that hill that he climbed that changed everything for humanity. And we thank you for the example of Jonathan. And as a young man, what incredible courage he showed. We might look back and always remember that there are some amongst us, and I hope many of us, that will stand up, be courageous, do good, and change our world. Thank you. God bless you, Menian Christian Fellowship.